Are we allowed to be judgmental? And what does Christianity have to do with the exodus from Egypt? Plus, how to love and be loved. This is Rabbi Yossi Madvig, and you're listening to Jews Did It First. Thank you so much for tuning in, and please subscribe and leave a review. Also, if you'd like to donate to help contribute to the podcast, please go to jewishoswego.org slash Jews Did It First and click the Make a Donation button in the upper right-hand corner. And now, Jews Did It First. Today I want to talk about another common phrase that we all know and never really think about its source. That is, don't judge a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. The comedian Emo Phillips once said, never judge someone until you've walked a mile in his shoes. That way, when you do judge him, you're already a mile away and you have his shoes. But seriously, its meaning is pretty simple. We are unable to make moral judgments against another if we haven't experienced his situation. We'll get into the origins of this in just a minute. But first, think for a second. Is that really true? I mean, if Ruvain kills Shimon, do we say, hey, you can't judge Ruvain because we don't know his situation? Or do we say, you did the crime, now do the time? I think if we're honest, we do the latter. I mean, that's what the whole criminal justice system is for, right? So what does this mean? Now perhaps you're thinking, Rabbi, how can you dissect this? It's just a nice saying, which means don't be judgmental. To this I have two responses. One, what is the point of a moral dictum if we intentionally structure our society in the exact opposite manner? Well, that doesn't seem to make any sense at all. And two, I think we can determine its true meaning and its particular application because Jews did it first. Until today, perhaps you thought, like one blogger I found, that the phrase's earliest appearance is with the Cherokee Native Americans. They have a saying, don't judge a man until you've walked two moons in his moccasins. That's way more than a mile. But that also only goes to the 18th century. Not that impressive. And so many European cultures have a similar phrase that it's hard to believe that the Native Americans were the first. Some say that it's so ubiquitous that it's just a human truism, and it was independently invented by just about every culture. But I tend to think that if something is so ubiquitous, then it's not that everyone figured it out. I just don't have that much faith in human consensus, I'm sorry. Not even something like the modern-day nation-state was independently done by everyone, so I just don't buy it. I can't necessarily disprove it, so I suppose it remains a moot point. But just like the last common phrase, where we took the Mishnah of Pirkei Avot, which is the late 2nd, early 3rd century work that quotes our sages of hundreds of years prior, that gave us the foundation of no pain, no gain, as we saw. Well, in chapter 2, Mishnah 4, Rabbi Hillel says, yes, the same Rabbi Hillel of the Golden Rule, based on the biblical verse. Rabbi Hillel says in the 1st century BCE, Do not judge your friend until you've reached his place. Remarkable, no? Almost 2,000 years before the earliest known usage of the phrase, Judaism already had this one in the bag. Now, back to our question. Can we ever judge people? Ever? What I'm about to say is primarily based on a philosophical work called Lukute Amarim, or as it's known colloquially, the Tanya. In chapter 30, it was written by Rabbi Shneer Zalman of Liadi, the founder of the Chabad Hasidic movement, in the year 1797. He quotes the Mishnah, don't judge your fellow until you've come to his place, and he comments, for it is his place that causes him to sin, because his livelihood requires him to go to the market for a whole day, and to be one of those who sit at the street corners where his eyes behold all the temptations. The eye sees, and the heart desires, and his evil nature is kindled like a baker's red-hot oven. The Mishnah isn't trying to uproot the entire concept of the judicial system. That would be absolutely ridiculous, especially since Jews are notorious for being overly analytical and legalistic. Plus, 
the Torah itself prescribes very clear reward and punishment for keeping and breaking the law. So what is it saying? When it comes to a person's actions, we have to say that we have total agency. The very fact that God provides reward and punishment as consequences of our actions forces us into a position to say that free will does exist and has real-world consequences. However, we should also recognize that a person has their own trials. What might be an easy moral test for me to overcome may be more difficult for you, and vice versa. This could be because of natural tendencies, as well as our cultural surroundings and upbringing. What would you have done if you were in his situation? Perhaps this is just one of the reasons why the death penalty is incredibly difficult to implement in Judaism. So much so that the Talmud says that a court that administers the death penalty once in seven years, in another version it says once in 70 years, is considered a murderous court. So, judge their physical actions in the strict legal sense, of course, but judge their soul in your heart and how you feel about them as a person, as a child of God, that we are enjoined by our sages to avoid. And now, the counter-missionary. This next verse we'll look at is not so popular, but it's something the New Testament itself points to as a prophecy of the Messiah, or at least a text they feel that uh, Mr. Jesus fulfills. The New Testament claims that he went to Egypt to flee some sort of evil decree by Hordus, Herod. The verse it supposedly fulfills is Hosea, Hosea 11.1, 1, Out of Egypt I called my son. There's a serious problem here. If you actually read the whole verse, the claim makes no sense whatsoever. Hosea 11.1 1 reads, When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The first part of the verse clearly identifies the son here as Israel, the Jewish people, being called out of Egypt. That is, the Exodus. Remember Moses, Pharaoh? They made a movie about it, I think. This sounds a lot like our Isaiah 53 problem. You take a reference to the Jews and apply it to a single individual. And furthermore, not only is Hosea not making a messianic prophecy, he's not even speaking about the future, but the past. So, I don't particularly agree with this verse being used as a messianic prophecy in any way, shape, or form, and I think the missionaries have a serious problem on their hands with this one in particular. Okay, let's talk about love. You know, I just did a wedding this past weekend, and it went wonderfully. The bride and groom did a great job. Yours truly, of course, did a fantastic job, if I do say so myself. It was my first kosher wedding that I've ever done, so it was really exciting, and uh, I hope to do many, many more. So, there's a beautiful mitzvah in the Torah that is the basis for the golden rule. Remember back to episode one? It seems to come up a lot, no? That mitzvah is in Leviticus 19.18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But how is that possible? I mean, we love ourselves a lot, usually unconditionally, if we're a healthy person. So how can I apply how I love myself to every single Jew? There are many explanations to this, but I want to focus on two things. How to love and what is love. We see the first time love is mentioned in the Torah is by Abraham loving Isaac. God says, take your son, your only son, the one that you love. The second time is by Isaac himself, loving Rebekah. And he took her for his wife, and he loved her. And the third and fourth time is when it says that Isaac loved Esau, and Rebekah loved Jacob. Do you see the pattern here? The one who is loved can love. It is so critical that we love others, so that they in turn can love. But how can we love? Because we are loved by God Almighty. We are his children, as it says, you are children of the Lord your God. He loves us like an only child, and therefore we can, in turn, love. But what does love look like? God actually shows us in the creation of the universe. He made space, as it were, for us to exist. I mean, if God is infinite and everywhere and everything and so on, so in order for us to exist as independent beings, he has to somewhat remove himself from the picture, so to speak, in order that we not just be completely nullified in his existence. So the ultimate expression 
of love for another is to make space, to remove our ego and put another first. This works for loving our fellow Jews as well as God himself. We're commanded in the first paragraph of Shema, the quintessential Jewish prayer from Deuteronomy chapter 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. When we take our own will and desire out of the picture and put God's first, that is truly loving God. So the next time you don't feel like eating kosher or observing Shabbat, think about how God set his very self aside, so to speak, to give you life. Then, momentarily, set aside your own self, just for a minute, a day, an hour, to do something for God and for your fellow Jew. Thanks for listening. I'd love to keep in touch, so please feel free to continue the conversation with me on the Facebook page, Jews Did It First, or email rabbi at jewishoswego.org. I'm also on Twitter at Oswego Rabbi. Until next week, Shabbat Shalom. I promise to be loyal and faithful I'll represent you, I won't disgrace you